So we were just on a panel together, just doing our fireside chat, and there we talked about this idea of over-deployment, that in 2019, one and a half trillion dollars was the net asset value of assets within private equity. Now that figure is two and a quarter trillion, a huge amount of growth. What's going to be the consequence of that growth? Well, yeah, our industry unfortunately over-deployed in 2021 and 2022. And at a time when rates were lower, the 10-year in the U.S. was about one and a half. Now it's four and a half, and multiples have come down in a result. In the, pri as pri in the private markets, we're down about three turns of multiple, and that's going to mean those vintages are challenged. And what we're hearing from LPs is because we overdeployed in that period of time when values were higher and liquidity is going to be lower, what that means is LPs have spent all this money and they're not going to get money back anytime soon. So it's creating a more difficult fundraising environment. So for companies that really suffered of this problem, that did a lot of over-deployment, are we talking about consolidation in the industry? Will some funds struggle to survive because of the over-deployment, the challenge that is to valuations of exiting and to fundraising now? I'm not prepared to predict that, but I think those vintages and those funds are going to be tougher. To the extent your, your fund is overexposed to those periods of time when values were higher and, and people overspent, then that's going to be a tougher fund. Do, do you see consolidation in general in this industry if we are going into a period of toughness? You know, I don't think so. You know, there have been certainly stake sales of private equity firms, but I don't, I don't foresee some big wave of consolidation where bigger firms are buying up a bunch of smaller private equity firms. Right. We, we also talked about this idea of less IPOs, less exits happening in the world. To what degree is this temporary or a structural shift that just the world doesn't want to be public anymore? Well, I think part of it is structural. If you look at it, the number of public companies in the U.S. has gone from 8,000 to about 4,500. So companies are staying private longer and, yeah, are not accessing the IPO markets as much as, as they once did. And so you're seeing this institutionalization of, of private markets. And that has certainly benefited uh, private equity. And I think it's also benefited the performance of private markets relative to the public markets. You know, if you look at the Russell 2000, and you compare that relative to the buyout universe in terms of growth and margins and return on capital, the private markets today have a stronger portfolio. And then on top of that, private market investors can pick their assets, choose their management teams, pick their entry and exit points, you know, customize their capital structures, design really sophisticated incentive plans, and drive value creation. So I think for both of those reasons, the public markets, I think, are set to continue to, the, the private markets are set to continue to outperform. I wonder what to degree this is a healthy trend. Because if you think of everyday retail investors, their access into the market, it's through an ETF. It's maybe they log on to their Schwab account and choose individual funds. What does it mean for the world if they have le less of an option, if more of the companies that they can access are just such a small percentage of the universe. Yeah, well, I think we're going to have to find ways for retail investors to participate in the private markets as this shift you know, continues and as the private markets continue to gain share. And today, the way it works is, if you, for the most part, if, you're a, uh, if you have a pension fund, your pension fund might get good access to alternatives. But short of that, you, you know, historically, you've been out of luck. And there's a number of managers, including us, you know, who are working on the so-called democratization right. of alternatives. So in, in this world of maybe more muted returns, I know one way that you're trying to squeeze out performance is by looking at the corporate culture. I know you're giving equity to some of your companies, some of the workers in those companies. You're looking at CEO empathy as a measure. Pete, this, this is very different. You're almost Pete the psychologist just as much as you are Pete the investor. What was the change in mindset for you? What, what prompted you to start looking at this as a factor of company attractiveness? Oh, gosh. Well, part of it is how I grew up. My dad was a construction worker, was a member of a union, and he hated his company. And there was, you know, we lived through a lot of strikes as a family growing up. And that left a mark, for sure. And you could also see not only it, it, it being bad for my dad and his colleagues, but it was bad for the company. I mean, at every turn, if my dad had a chance, he stuck it to the company, believe me. And that is corporate America. You know, 70% of Americans are disengaged on the job. An average company has between 15 and 20% of its employees that Gallup defines as actively disengaged, meaning they are literally throwing wrenches in the machines trying to hurt their employer. So there's a huge opportunity here to help human beings be more engaged at work, happier on the job, 
and to help investors drive better cultures. You know, in the United States, the quit rate peaked recently at 40%. So four in 10 Americans quitting their jobs. What a waste. What a waste of human potential for people to be just bouncing around from job to job. Right. And what a waste for productivity and corporate performance. And, and I guess, you know, we can say, look, that sounds really great to have, to be giving folks options, equity options in the company, to be giving them equity. But we're talking about often blue collar war workers, maybe on a factory floor, maybe like your dad. These are complicated financial products for them. And presumably some of them would rather maybe just get a paycheck, a higher paycheck, so they can go on a vacation. How do you solve for that financial literacy issue? Well, the, first, on your last point, this cannot be a trade for wages. Right. Uh, that, that is a core principle of ours. You can't give stock and take away wage increases or a 401k match. It's got to be incremental. Now, to your point, this is hard to do. It sounds so easy, like you just give workers stock and they're happy. That's not what happens. They need to be... Um, it kept in for, it, if you're a worker and you get given stock, guess what? Your expectations of the company just went up. You tell me I'm an owner. I want to know, like, what's the business plan? Where are we headed? How can I help? How am I doing? You know, most people go home at the end of, of, of their day job and they, they talk to their partner and their partner's like, how was your day? How'd you do? No idea. I get no feedback. I don't know how we did. So sharing information, teaching about the business, driving employee engagement, teaching financial literacy, that hard work has to go together with employee ownership. Right. Others, it's not going to work. The, 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 the magic is getting employees to feel respected, trusted, valued, like they're more than just dispensable widgets. And then that, then you've got a chance to really to, to rise up and, and change the culture. Yeah. And to your point, it's the leadership. So with great leadership, anything is possible. You can move mountains. Right. And with poor leadership, it's never going to happen. Which gets to your empathy point. Right. And, and, but Pete, it's, it sounds really wonderful, but you know that there, and I'm sure you've gotten this, I'm sure there are people who've listened to this and said, Pete Stavros, it sounds great, but it's nothing but fluff. It is a PR stunt. In fact, I could pull up an example of a KKR company that didn't like being bought, you know, Pimlico Plumbers, recently interviewed by Bloomberg, who look at these sorts of things and say, this is just a P PR stunt. What do you say to those skeptics? What do you say to them to say, this is not just an activity, an, an image of KKR. Well, I would say there's too much substance. I, you know, we used to get that. Right. You know, we've been at this 15 years. I would say in the beginning, people would say, oh, you're giving stock. It's a, it's a PR stunt. There's so much substance to it. So when we show workers' lives being changed, and not just financially, but the way they feel about themselves and their role in the company, and we have data to show you know, engagement scores and quit rates, engagement scores going up and quit rates going down. Yeah. I think that's kind of over the like, there's no substance. What, I, what we do here now is, well, you're doing it, there's substance, but the reason you're doing it is because of PR. And it's like, you know, I can only tell you inside of the firm, there is no discussion about like, if we do this, people will think better of us. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And, in and our this goes bigger than KKR. I mean, you have a whole charity about this, getting folks to sign up. Yeah, and I should say, in KKR, you know, this is the, the, this is what Henry and George did from day one. Everyone participates at our firm, whether you're uh, a new executive assistant or you're the most senior investor, everyone has stock in our firm, right. everyone participates. So that's the example that they set. And yes, at Ownership Works, this is about much more than just what we're doing at KKR. We've now got a coalition of, I don't know, upwards of 100 organizations working right. together on this. So think of not just investment firms and Wall Street banks, but we've got um, pension funds. We have union leaders working with us. Um, we've got nonprofit foundations, right. some of whom fund the most critical organizations of private equity out there. We're all working together to try and make this effective.